Yeah, good morning all. Can everybody hear me? Good. So uh, I want to talk about hair. Uh, hair is actually the topic of, uh, of, doctor, of Charles Grunewald's doctoral thesis. And so I'm in an unusual situation here to present actually the thesis of one of my students. Uh, Charles couldn't make it uh, because of personal reasons, uh, but then I'll try to do his work uh, justice. So the work is motivated by the observation that uh, future processors may not be cache coherent because actually implementing or scaling, you know, cache coherent shared memory, hardware cache coherent shared memory to a large number of cores might be expensive. Now, currently, it's today the case that most, you know, processors you use today are actually cache coherent, but when we see examples of processors that are not, you know, cache coherent shared memory, for example, the Intel single chip and cell processor, the T10 map, and the, some GPU uh, processors. So, you know, what have these processors in common? The, if you think about it, sort of you know, take a step back, you know, there's a number of cores sharing a single DRAM, but every core has its own private L1 or L2 caches that are actually not cache coherent. So if one core reads some data from DRAM, modifies that in, it, uh, it modifies that in its local you know, cache, and then another core reads that same data from DRAM, it will actually not observe the changes that the first core made because you know, the second core won't directly fetch that content from the other core's cache. So a read can return stale data or inconsistent data. And so what we wanted to do or we wanted to figure out is what, what it does it take to build uh, a coherent Unix file system on top of a platform that actually doesn't provide coherence. And, and the reason we wanted to do that is you know, because it's highly convenient for programmers to actually have a file system. You know, you can create files in a directory, you know, look them up later in a directory, uh, write a file on one core, you know, read it on another core. So it's usually convenient, you know, it's nice to have shared file descriptors so you can orchestrate your computations across the machine. But of course, you know, the question is like how to avoid, you know, stale data. Because the POSIX interface, you know, requires, you know, that you actually return uh, that the read of a file observed the preceding writes. So it's also not completely directly obvious how to do this. You know, you can't take Linux of a shared memory file system and run it on this kind of machines because they fundamentally rely on cache coherence. Um, so, you know, basically this talk is about like sort of the design, you know, path that we went through to try to figure out actually how to, how to do that. So, of course, you know, the first thing you think of is, oh, well, this is easy. We run a single file server on one core and it has all the file system state because it's the only core that interacts with the file system state, you know, it owns the only core that will have that state in this L1 and L2 private caches, so there's no consistency issues. Now, of course, you know, this provides limited scalability because, you know, all these clients are sending messages to this single file server and overloading the single file server. So you're really not going to get actually much uh, terms in, form, in terms of scalability or performance. So then the obvious next step to say, well, we'll take a page out of the you know, clustered file system literature, correct? And we'll just shard you know, the file system across multiple servers so that at least we can concurrency for operations that actually work on different shards. And we'll also do aggressive client caching on the client side so that we even don't overload a single shard, you know, so that we don't have to you know, avoid basically doing the cheapest RPCs, no RPC at all. Um, and so, of course, that, you know, brings us back to where we started, which is, you know, that probably gives us better scalability and better performance, but then the question is how to do coherence. You know, for example, if operations span, you know, multiple shards, you know, you need some protocol for doing that. Similarly, you know, to make sure that you're reading, not reading stale data, you need some consistency protocol. And so basically here is sort of a new design point in this sort of humongous literature on file systems that basically combines uh, existing sort of shared memory techniques with, you know, distributed systems techniques to actually provide uh, a you know, POSIX file system on a non-cache coherent machine. And so, for example, from the distributed systems side, you know, it actually uses massive passing between clients and servers, it uses close to open consistency, and uh, it uses multi-phase protocols. On the shared memory side, because, you know, the machine is a single failure domain, we can just assume that the clients and servers fail together. So we actually can assume reliable messages for the more, we can assume that messages can be implemented very efficiently because you can you know, send them basically through DRAM. For the more, because when we actually have a shared DRAM, we can also have a shared you know, unified buffer cache, and we don't have to split you know, the buffer cache across uh, multiple uh, cores. And finally, you know, we were sort of trying to shoot you know, for a rich POSIX semantics, namely basically being able to run standard sort of shared memory from file system applications on top of this file system. Um, so these sort of techniques we adopt from the shared memory side. In fact, we almost adopt most techniques are shared memory or, in, oriented, except that we don't have cache coherence. Shared, uh, cache coherence. So the contributions of you know, uh, Charles's thesis were basically a set of protocols 
uh, for, you know, uh, for managing file system state basically in a scalable and efficient manner, exploiting shared DRAM and efficient and reliable messaging. You know, he implemented that you know, set of protocols inside of a prototype that we call HAIR. And HAIR allows sharing of files directly, file descriptors, pipes, you know, a, a large part of the, uh, the POSIX interface, uh, and supports, therefore, many of the POSIX applications out of the box. And as you will see in the evaluation, you know, actually, the HAIR actually gets pretty decent performance and scalability. So, to, um, so our, our goal was to implement POSIX faithfully enough that we can basically run complex uh, POSIX applications on top of HAIR without few or no modifications. And just as a target, we wanted to be able to actually build the Linux kernel on top of HAIR uh, without much modifications. And this is actually challenging uh, because you know, GMake actually internally has a process scheduler that forks our processes, then arranged, you, know, you get a lot of parallelism. And then users are, the kernel built uses a lot of little utilities, uh, POSIX utilities. And so in fact, you know, this workload stresses a ton of POSIX features. You know, shared files, shared directories, file descriptors, pipes, signals, you know, uh, you name it, you know, basically you know, every corner of POSIX actually being stressed by this workload. Now, in this talk, I'm just going to focus on files and directories uh, because there's not enough time, uh, but the paper has a lot more detail on all the other shared abstractions. So to start simple, um, you know, start with uh, consistency for shared files. You know, clearly, you know, you would like to be the case, or POSIX requires, that, you know, one application creates a file, writes to the file, uh, closes the file, then another application opens the file, you know, reads from that file, that actually that reads you'd observe those writes from the previous uh, application. And of course, you know, the problem here is that the data might actually be in the uh, private cache of the first application, and so we've got to make sure, you know, that actually the second application does observe that data. And here, immediately, you see actually an interesting combination of shared memory techniques and distributed uh, techniques that HAIR uses. First of all, we adopt, you know, close to open consistency from the standard, you know, distributed systems literature. But, you know, HAIR exploits the fact that there's actually a shared DRAM and actually has a shared buffer cache. So when an application calls open, you know, open, you know, like in a distributed system, you know, we send, an, the client sends an, uh, an RPC or a message, you know, to the file server and asks, you know, basically for that file. But in, in distributed systems, you know, you would send back all the data blocks. Except in here, if we don't do that, we actually should send a list of block numbers. Because the blocks are living actually in the shared DRAM. So the server actually sends back a list of block numbers. And now the client can actually directly access, you know, the blocks in the shared DRAM uh, uh, to read and write to them. We also cache, you know, sort of additional meta file system state on the client side, you know, like size and offset and things like that. So at the point that we're actually the, file, the application is done and calls close, we have to make sure, you know, that we do something to make sure that future applications, the next application, will see, observe their changes. And so, in fact, when the client calls close, you know, the, or the application calls is closed, the client library actually flushes, you know, the state, you know, from its private caches back to, you know, DRM, as well as flushing any metadata state back to the server so that, you know, later applications actually uh, observe those changes. And in fact, the later application, when it calls open, it actually has to invalidate, you know, its, you know, private cache, you know, make sure that it actually does observe those last changes. Now, even in the case of file sharing, or you know, simple file sharing, there are many, many corner cases actually in the POSIX interface that actually get right. And in fact, I'm not going to talk about them. They're all in the paper, and they're use similar types of protocols, you know, the ones that I just described on the previous slide. You know, you can sort of work out the details in your head. So instead, I want to focus a little bit on directories, because directories are a little bit more unusual uh, in here. Um, and the observation, the reason they're a little bit more unusual is that because if you want to run uh, on many applications, they store the same sort of files, in this, many files in the same directory. And so if you want to get some parallelism out of that, you know, basically directory operations have to be concurrent. And so that means you can't really store a single directory at a single server, which is typically the case uh, in a distributed file system. And instead, you know, what you want to do clearly is shard a single directory across multiple co cores so that you can do directory operations and concurrently. So, you know, HAIR does that, as well as aggressive, you know, name caching on the client side. You know, that introduces a bunch of complications, namely with removing directories and removing files. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both sharding and uh, client name caching. So the way uh, HAIR shards a directory is pretty straightforward. You know, it basically takes the hash of the parent directory inode number and the name of the directory entry and hashes that across a number of servers. And then we just assume for, you know, this talk that the number of servers is constant. 
Uh, and so the client will get a server ID back. The client will send in a lookup message you know, to that server ID to actually find out where the server is that actually cor stores the corresponding inode. Now the complication with sharding comes in with remove directory. And the reason there's a complication is because, uh, according to POSIX, you know, directories can be removed only if empty at every shard. Uh, otherwise, you know, it should return a failure. So you know, the first you know, thing that comes to mind is to say, oh, that's easy. I'm just going to contact every uh, shard, find out if, uh, if, and check if every shard has no entries. If every shard has no entries, then we're done. Of course, that doesn't really work. Uh, because when midway, while you're checking you know, all the different shards, you know, some other application actually might add a file to the directory. And at that particular point, it should fail. So uh, what, what Hair does, actually, it adopts you know, a two-phase commit protocol to actually implement uh, removing directories for sharded uh, directories. So what it does, actually, in phase one, it basically contacts every shard and takes a lock out on every shard. Uh, and the, every shard reports back you know, to the master or the client saying whether it actually has an empty shard or a non-empty shard. Now, one, one thing is interesting here is that we actually take out the lock. That's okay. In a distributed system, that would be a dangerous thing to do because the client might fail. Right? But we're assuming a single failure domain, so it's perfectly fine for us actually to take uh, a lock out there on the, the file server. So once the client receives you know, responsive from every shard, you know, it can decide whether actually to abort basically this two-phase commit or actually you know, commit to it. And so can, let's assume that actually the, the shards are empty. It will just send a message, a commit message to every file server, every shard, saying, yeah, please release the lock and commit. One of the things that's interesting, and I will talk about that in a second, is that actually the commit doesn't require an acknowledgment. And I will, uh, mention, we'll talk about it in a, in a second. Now, this is still not completely correct. Right? So this, this deals with the case you know, when one application calls remove directory and another application actually adds a, a file to the directory, but it doesn't deal with the case if two uh, clients actually are trying to remove the directory at the same time. Because there's a, ri you know, there's a risk you know, of a deadlock you know, if they actually contact the shards in different order. And so we do the simple thing. We actually add one more phase, uh, which you know, we serialize you know, the, uh, the operation first on a designated home node. So the, the client cont uh, contacts the designated home node first, gets a lock, you know, the, one of the two clients is going to win, and then it is going to like, complete the whole two-phase commit protocol, as I described in the previous slide. So um, sharding has some implications, correct? You know, it's clearly good for op concurrent operations within the same directory, but you know, it actually uh, is not so good for, um, for applications, for example, list the directory, because they have to contact every shard. Right? Or you have to remove the directory, you also have to cont contact every shard. So to deal with this sort of uh, trade-off, you know, we are currently asked the programmer to specify whether the directory should be sharded or not sharded. You know, if, so if, you, uh, if an application wants to do a lot of concurrent file operations on the directory, it should shard it, otherwise probably not. An interesting direction of future research, of course, is to figure out whether we can do this dynamically and decide between the two modes of operation. So talk a little bit about name caching. Um, you know, clearly, applications, you know, in the workloads that we were looking for, applications you know, frequently access the same directory, so we want to cache uh, lookup information at the client side in the same way that distributed file systems do. And you know, this alleviates you know, congestion at the shards, and you know, we just avoid the number of RPCs, so we get better performance. Now, of course, the problem is name consistency. Uh, and so you know, typically, the way that is addressed directly at the, in a distributed file system is that when one you know, a client calls a rename, contacts the server, the server then actually sends invalidation messages to every client that might actually have that name cached. In the distributed systems, it's actually crucial that the file server waits on the acknowledgement from the clients before actually proceeding or returning from the rename. Because you might have to make sure that the lookup that actually is after the rename returns an error if the file actually has been removed. Now, it's a little bit too bad, you know, you have to wait for that acknowledgement. But in here, or in a machine that we actually have, we don't really have to do that uh, because we can exploit the fact that we actually have reliable messaging. And so the way Harry exploits that is the, when the server sends an invalidation message to the client, by the time the server returns from the send, we know that the message actually has been deposited in the client library. Furthermore, the client follows the protocol that before actually doing a lookup, it drains you know, the queue, it's in a particular queue of messages. So this guarantees that you know, if a rename returns to the client, at that particular point in time, all you know, clients that actually had that name cached have their caches have been invalidated, and so we get correct behavior. But you know, we get the advantage that we actually don't have to wait for the acknowledgement, and this is in the same way that you know, the acknowledgement that we can cut out in the, in the commit phase of the two-phase commit protocol. 
So it gives you sort of a flavor for the you know, different things you can do uh, once you're sort of playing in the scheme of you know, combining distributed memory techniques and, uh, and distributed systems techniques. Um, there's many other design challenges uh, you know, related, for example, to process management, and we have to implement fork, you know, we have to implement shared file descriptors. Uh, we presumably, you know, we actually do take, aware, we take advantage of new awareness. Uh, you know, we, the, implementing a high-performance message library, as you know, many people have done in the past, is also not a completely trivial operation. And you know, I, have to, you know, I have to forward you through the paper to actually look up in the, the details. Instead, I want to talk a little bit about the prototype and the evaluation. Uh, so we run, we implement it here on top of Linux. Uh, and the reason we did that is so that we can, at least for all the local uh, system calls, we can just redirect them st straight forward directly to Linux and don't have to re-implement it. So we don't have to re-implement cat pit and all the other, you know, many, many system calls that Linux supports that are just local operations. For all the file system operations or all, all the shared abstraction operations, uh, we use an LD preload trick where, you know, the application runs, then we transparently, you know, redirect the system call to the application library or the hair library. And then the hair library just exclusively, exclusively uses message passing to actually communicate with other uh, file servers, as well as with a scheduling server that actually does the uh, forking across, you know, different cores. The, you know, the, you know, Charles wrote about, about 14,000 lines of code to actually sort of implement this. You know, the prototype has a number of limitations. Uh, first of all, the library actually is in user space and really should be in the kernel if it actually is really a single failure domain and you know, also for, for fault isolation reasons. I don't think it really changes the results that I will show later, uh, but it is a limitation. The other limitation uh, is that it's an in-memory file system. And so uh, it actually doesn't provide persistence. So basically we didn't implement sync or f-sync uh, and focus completely on the scalability and the parallelism issues. Um, also, in a particular prototype, you know, we can only deal with sort of single-threaded processes, or if we have multiple threaded processes, they're all run on the same core. Um, now, despite these limitations, uh, Hair actually runs a wide range of workloads, you know, actually is able to run or build the Linux kernel on top, you know, of Hair itself. Uh, all the sort of normal utilities it runs, many of the uh, benchmarks that people have used, you know, to evaluate parallel operating system or multi-core operating system, they run fine, as well as larger applications. And, and only in a very few cases we have to make modifications, mostly related to sh uh, specifying the sharding flag um, when creating a directory. You know, to give you a little bit of sense of uh, 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 what the performance is, you know, we need to run on some hardware platform. And unfortunately, you know, we don't really have a great um, uh, non-cache coherent uh, hardware platform. So instead, when you're using basically a standard shared memory multiprocessor, multi-core platform, uh, it has uh, four Intel Xeon chips, uh, each of 10 cores, so we have a total of 40 cores. Um, now, although the platform, the hardware, provides cache coherent chip memory, Hair doesn't rely on that at all, other than for sending messages from one core to another core. So Hair doesn't use you know, the shared memory, the cache coherence part of the shared memory at all. But it's interesting because it allows us to do a direct comparison. Right? On this machine, we can actually run a shared memory file system like Linux you know, and you know, do a comparison between the two. And it gives a little bit, you know, sense about like, you know, what were we paying for if we're not actually using uh, cache coherence. Um, so, uh, we, you know, I can't run all the applications that I showed on the previous uh, slide. So, you know, we picked a bunch of them, uh, and they're sort of from left to right, you know, going from micro benchmarks to, you know, complete, you know, the build of the Linux kernel. And then this slide sort of shows, you know, the mixture of, you know, RPCs. And you can see on the left side that the microkernels do a few, the micro benchmarks do a few RPCs a lot. But then on the right side, you know, you see there's a huge mixed load of, you know, mixed uh, load of different types of RPC, hair RPCs. So this, you know, set of benchmarks, you know, stresses hair in all kinds of interesting ways. Now in terms of uh, scalability, uh, you know, here's the usual scalability graph where, you know, on the x-axis we have the number of cores speed up on the y-axis. And, you know, we see actually many of the lines actually go nicely trend up, uh, which is what you hope uh, for scalability. Now, we don't get perfect scalability at all, correct? For example, at, you know, 40 cores, you know, the best we do is at 18 or 20. But, you know, it's a pretty, you know, the lines seem to keep going up. So if we add more cores, hopefully we'll get even more, uh, we get more performance. There's one benchmark that doesn't do that good, correct? The one that flattens out uh, the blue one on the bottom. And that is actually the, a parallel find on sparse directories. And so if we have sparse directories, you know, they're going to be sitting on a single shard, and so basically you get a herding effect, and the single shard becomes a bottleneck, and so it doesn't scale. The, uh, one of the interesting aspects is in this graph, what I'm showing is that basically every core runs a client and a server. 
But that's not the way you have to run here. Correct? You could actually decide to split you know, or dedicate some cores to uh, particular servers or to servers. And so this slide shows actually you know, whether that actually an advantage to do, whether that's an advantage to do so. And in some cases it is. So for example, in the Linux kernel build case, if you dedicate six cores to file servers and use 34 you know, for uh, clients, then actually you're going to get better you know, throughput compared to this, the previous slide that I showed. Um, and you also see that for different applications, it's different. And so an interesting direction of future research is maybe to try to figure out whether it's possible to sort of dynamically decide, you know, what is the right number of servers for some given workload. Um, now, these previous graphs are all, you know, scalability graphs or normalized to single uh, CPU performance. So it's interesting to note what actually is the single core performance. Um, and so here we do actually, you know, we run basically uh, Linux, we use a RAM file system, so also an in-memory file system, and compare uh, how they do with each other. And as you can see, Linux does actually qu quite a bit better. And a large part this is due to, there's sort of three main reasons why Linux does a lot better, uh, varying from a factor two to three. Um, the, one of the reasons is that, you know, we're paying a much, you know, for message passing. And there's two costs to message passing. One is the context switching overhead on a single you know, a core. And you can see that if you compare the green bar with the blue bar. The blue bar runs the client and the server on two on different cores. And you can see that in that case, we get a lot better performance. And that's purely because of context switching overhead. The context switching overhead is almost a factor three compared to our message passing overhead. But then the rest is uh, we pay for message passing overhead, as well as actually our scheduling you know, is not as good as you know, the optimizer to Linux kernel. Um, just as a check, you know, we also run an NFS server on the same uh, core, uh, just to see how much how worse that is. And as you can see, that's dramatically worse than actually uh, dramatically worse uh, than uh, actually hair does, except on the Linux build case, because actually that a lot of that is computational oriented. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of the single core performance. Now, the single core performance of Linux, you would expect that to translate also if we run on a larger number of cores. And so here's the same, uh, here's at 40 cores, the speed ups and the absolute performance that we're getting on this machine. And so in Linux, on the 40 core case, you know, scales as well and still has sort of this performance advantage that it had on the single uh, core. Uh, but the key point here to point out is for the machine that we're targeting, correct? You know, Linux couldn't run on that machine at all. You know, the only option to actually run on that machine is hair because, you know, the machine that we're targeting doesn't have cache coherent chip memory, and Linux really relies on cache coherent chip memory. But it gives you a little bit of an indication, like, what the cost is of not providing cache coherent to applications. Now, on the left side of the graph, you actually notice that uh, hair outperforms Linux at 40 cores. It scales better, and in absolute terms, it has better performance. This is mostly a micro benchmark, and these are bench or these are applications benchmarks and applications that involve directory operations, a lot of concurrent directory operations. And Linux currently actually has a single lock on a directory. So if the many uh, uh, cores perform an operation on the create files in the same directory, they're starting to contend for the lock, and therefore you see actually not very good performance on the left side uh, for those applications. Okay. So this sort of suggests that probably, you know, uh, sharding of directories is maybe a shared, a shared memory file system should adopt that technique too. Now, it's clear from, presumably from the talk so far that we're adopting a lot of techniques from uh, related work, uh, particularly previous you know, file systems, either clustered file systems or distributed file systems or file systems for S&P kernels or multi-kernel designs. You know, there's a lot of techniques that we're borrowing from lots of different uh, uh, systems. And I think really what we're doing is adding a new design point that where we sort of use this interesting mix of shared memory techniques and distributed systems techniques uh, to build a sort of scalable uh, file system. And the things that we're like, exploiting basically is that there's a single failure domain, so we have uh, reliable messages. Uh, because there's a, single D there's a shared DRAM, we can actually have a unified buffer cache instead of have a partition buffer cache. Because the way we set up the protocols, we get atomic message delivery, so that allows us to skip invalidation messages. Uh, for example, in the commit phase, as well as in the uh, uh, invalidation of uh, name caches. And furthermore, because we're using shared memory, you know, we get low latency message passing, which allows us to actually use these multi-phase, you know, protocols, you know, for in, uh, efficiently. So, in conclusion, uh, you know, hopefully, I, you know, if you ever want to plan to build, you know, a file system on a non-cache coherent shared memory machine, you know, hopefully this talk will give you some good ideas about how to go about it.
uh, you know, it's totally possible to, you know, we're, when we started out this project, we had no idea what this was actually possible or, and even to get reasonable performance. And the conclusion actually is pretty positive. You know, you can actually run standard, you know, shared memory POSIX file system applications without too much problem, and you actually get pretty decent performance and scalability. So that, that's good news. Um, I, sh I should thank Charles uh, again and many times over because actually he did all the hard work. Uh, and uh, so he actually built hair, you know, he worked on the, uh, he designed the protocols, and I usually just answered questions for him. And uh, so uh, huge, huge credit, you know, to uh, Charles uh, for, for this work. So by that, I want to uh, conclude and uh, take any questions, if there are any questions. Okay, at the, the back. Hi, uh, Dushant Narayanan, uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, how, how important is this assumption you have of a single shared failure domain? Because there's other ways you can get sort of reliable in-memory writes for your messages. You can use RDMA, for example, and you can read remotely. But in those systems, typically, you, don't, you, you would like to have independent failures. So I was just wondering, how much would you have to change to make this work across a cluster like that? I think you, know, you have to change some of the protocols. Right? And I don't know how much impact that will have on performance. You know, the, uh, in the, uh, the paper actually breaks down for every technique uh, what an impact of uh, what the performance impact is of that for the individual applications. And so all the techniques I presented do have a positive contribution to uh, performance. Um, the, uh, you know, sort of cutting out, for example, these acknowledgments, you know, just drops the number of messages and you know, improves performance. Uh, so if you don't run, if there's not a single failure domain, you will have to start paying, you have to you know, change those protocols to actually deal with the fact that the message might get lost, correct? And it becomes more closer to a distributed system. Okay, one last question at the front here. Of course, all hard questions should be forwarded to Charles, correct? Hi, Cheng Tan from NYU. So, uh, very amazing and solid work. I have a, a, a question about the Strawman approach, which is running an FS on one core. So, do you have any you know, uh, statistics about the real-world application in that case? Because we are not expecting I.O. requests that much as uh, you know, memory access, we assume that maybe our request is not that frequent happens. So, yeah. is that okay. clearly for applications that don't use the file system, you know, it's perfectly fine to have a single server on one core. But for applications that actually use the file system intentionally, that's not going to work well. And in fact, you know, you could the the scalability results are not very good, you know, for those kind of applications. So, for example, for some of the the Linux kernel build, you know, would not actually get good performance. Uh, okay, I see. Thank you. Good. Let's thank Franz again. Thank you.